Okay, in this brief video, we are going to comprehend how very easy to distinguish specimens of digestive system and respiratory system, one from another. Really, they look very similar, but uh, the most effective way to investigate them is to um, compare different parts one with another, the most similar organs one with another. And let's start. Uh, so, the first pair to compare this is the duodenum and the pyloric part of the stomach. Those two specimens look similar because in the pyloric part, um, those gastric pits, they are rather deep and they could be confused with the villi in the small intestine, in the duodenum. Also, there are some mucus producing glands um, in the pyloric part as well as in the duodenum. They are also present. But what are the two criteria helping you to distinguish them very effectively and quickly? one from another. The first one is the thickness of the muscularis. Here you may see the two layers in the duodenum and the over uh, the total thickness of the muscularis is much less than the thickness of all other layers. If we look at the pyloric part, we'll find that this um, muscularis is very thick because it's very close to the sphincter region. Yeah, And uh, the thickness of the mucosum is much less than the thickness of all the other layers. So the relative thickness of the muscularis is the first criterion. The second one is the location of those glands. In the pyloric part of the stomach, glands are located in the lamina propria, while in the duodenum, they are located in the submucosum. Notice that here, lamina propria is occupied by cretum, and there is the muscularis mucosa in between them and only after that glands. And glands are in contact with the muscularis, while in the pyloric part between the muscularis and glands, there is the connective tissue, loose connective tissue of the submucosa. So this is the second criterion, very helpful, and let's move on. So duodenum and jejunum, another pair, very easy to confuse, but as you are the very clever students, you remember that in the duodenum there are lots of ceramicus glands in the submucosa we have just discussed, and these glands are absent in the jejunum. And the essence is that in the duodenum there is the necessity to neutralize the acidic content coming from the stomach. And in the jejunum the pH is already balanced, so there is no need to produce um, uh, this mucus. Um, notice that here also the muscularis mucosa very well distinguishable even in this low magnification subdividing lamina propria with crypts uh, from the submucosa occupied by glands. Um, okay, next pair is the fundus of the stomach and the colon or large intestine. Uh, what uh, is similar is that here in the colon we have crypts. Uh, crypts um, linear and parallel one with another and uh, there are no villi the surface is rather smooth as well as in the stomach also villi are absent and uh, uh, tubular glands are not branched so they are also organized parallel in the lamina propria as well as in the colon and how to distinguish them the very helpful criterion is that crypts are occupied by empty cells cells producing mucus and they are empty because mucus and water, they are removed when we prepare specimens. Um, so cells look like empty. While in the fundus of the stomach, you remember, chief um, cells and parietal cells are very numerous. So here cells either basophilic or oxophilic. So purple and pink, purple and red as in this case. So the color of the cells, pink and purple, while empty here. Okay, so the criteria like lymphoid aggregations, they might be present in the stomach as well. Now, those folds um, formed by submucosum also present in, in both cases. Uh, then uh, here the muscularis mucosa you may see, and here the same muscularis mucosa. So in both cases, uh, crypts and glands are located in the lamina propria. So look at the cell composition. Next, parotid gland versus pancreas very similar glands because both produce some proteins um, and uh, that's why cells um, they are stained in basophilic um, color purple color the first criterion helping you to distinguish uh, parotid from pancreas is the presence of those striated ducts um, you remember they are present in parotid and they are absent in pancreas they are very prominent in different magnifications uh, in large as well as in the small as in this case um, and um, 
please uh, just uh, pay attention. If you see them, this is the priority. They're absent. I think this is the pancreas. The second criterion, less helpful, but also it works. Um, this is the presence of uh, longer hands, eyelids of long hair hands. Uh, uh, they are more pale comparing with the exocrine part of the pancreas. And if you see them, if you can distinguish them, this is the criterion, of course, for the pancreas. Yes, endocrine portion is absent in the parotid gland. But in some cases, um, eyelids uh, are absent in specimens. I mean, in some regions of the pancreas, eyelids are absent. So this criterion is not so helpful as some um, straight dots. Um, also, pay attention to the connective tissue, which is of pink color, in our specimens uh, in the parotid gland. Uh, this tissue is much more developed uh, than in the pancreas, where it is almost absent. But this is only as for the specimens for the students. Um, okay, liver and parotid gland. I don't think this, uh, those two specimens could be confused, um, but um, in the liver, sometimes maybe, I don't know, central veins or triads uh, might be confused with the straight dots. Uh, but straight dots are much more prominent, uh, much more intensely stained, uh, so I, I don't believe you'll confuse. Also notice that in the parotid gland, uh, connective tissue is very well developed, while in the liver, lobules are not divided one from another with the connective tissue. If we are talking about liver, human liver, yeah, in the porcelain liver, connective tissue is more or less developed and um, in their liver can be confused with any other organ. So let's move on and uh, those two glands are very easy to confuse, so be attentive. Submandibular and sublingual, the difference is only in the ratio between the serous cells and mucous cells. You remember that in submandibular serous cells they predominate significantly and um, you can see them in, basi in basophilic color. So if purple cells with basophilic color predominate, prevail over those empty cells or mucus producing cells, then this is the submandibular. Notice purple cells predominate here. Yeah? In the sublingual gland, vice versa, we can see the prevalence of mucus cells. Remember that in mucus cells, um, uh, the cytoplasm is transparent, not acidophilic, but transparent, because, um, uh, as I have already said, uh, mucus together with glycoproteins is removed when we prepare specimen, it is dissolved in the water, and uh, a cytoplasm left empty while nuclei are shifted at the base, at the periphery. And if you see those acini with empty cells predominating over serous acini, then this is the sublingual gland. Now also pay attention, a straight ducts are um, very well prominent in both cases here, those straight ducts are. And also pay attention to the mixed acinus, very well distinguishable here, where serous cells uh, form so-called demiloons, well-known demiloons, uh, over the centrally located um, mucus cells. Um, okay, let's move on. Uh, now we are talking about the tongue, and we're going to compare the filiform papilla, fungiform, and um, foliate. Um, there is no problem in distinguishing filiform from foliate, yeah, but there is a great problem in distinguishing foliate from the fungiform. But let's talk about all of them one by one. Uh, first of all, this is the cat's tongue, so filiform papilla are very well developed, um, and they are just uh, bent backwards, um, as cats use their tongue to brush, to eat, for many other purposes. Uh, so, keratinized epithelium is present, while in filiform, fungiform epithelium is not keratinized. Also notice that taste buds are absent in filiform papilla, while they are very well distinguishable here in the foliate papilla. Uh, then, uh, the second question is how to distinguish fungiform from the foliate. Uh, the difference is in the presence of the secondary papilla. These are the projections of connective tissue inside the epithelial covering of those papilla. So in a fungiform papilla, connective tissue is located very close to the surface. So blood vessels, um, they give this red color to the fungiform papilla because they are located very close to the surface lining. And that's uh, what helps us to distinguish them from others. Notice also in the specimen lamina propria can be seen, and it is in direct contact with the 
skeletal muscles of the tongue. So submucosa is absent. I just want you to remember that in the lower ventral surface of the tongue, submucosa is present, while on the dorsal surface it is absent. And also pay attention here, we can see those uh, small salivary glands uh, draining those moths around or grooves uh, around papilla. Those salivary glands, uh, they help to remove old taste particles uh, and uh, allowing new tastants uh, to come in contact with the taste box. Um, let's move on. And here we have esophagus and trachea. Very difficult to, to confuse, very easy to distinguish, but both are tubular organs um, and uh, hollow organs. Um, and let's investigate them one by one. So in the esophagus, we have stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium which is very unique for digestive tube. I mean that after esophagus, starting from the stomach, uh, we have only simple epithelium up to the um, rectum. So if you see the stratified squamous hollow organ, this should be uh, esophagus. After this, we have, um, after epithelium, under the epithelium, there is the lamina propria made up of loose connective tissue. And uh, some glands might be found here, but in our specimens for students, they are not present, but in the lamina propria, cardiac glands might be found in the esophagus. So after that, the muscularis mucosa and uh, submucosa. In the submucosa, glands are present and they are very well developed, um, and in our specimens, uh, they are almost always present. So remember that in the submucosa proper esophageal glands are present and you should distinguish them from the cardiac glands. Cardiac glands are not present but might be present. So if you are asked during the practical lessons what's the difference between the cardiac and proper glands, you should answer that cardiac glands are located in the lamina propria while proper glands are in the submucosa. After that, we have muscularis, and muscularis could be a skeletal smooth, depending on the level. I remind you that in skeletal muscle fibers, if they are cross-sectioned, the nuclei are located at the periphery, while in the smooth muscles, uh, nuclei are in the center. Okay, uh, so what about the trachea? In the trachea, epithelium is pseudostratified ciliated. Um, after that, we have uh, lamina propria and submucosa. They are not separated by the muscularis mucosa. Muscularis mucosa is absent, and it's very important. Um, after that, uh, cartilage is present, which is C-shaped, because uh, esophagus is located behind, so it shouldn't be collapsed by trachea. And uh, this cartilage is surrounded by the perichondrium here, so nothing difficult. All envelopes are very well distinguishable, including the adventitia, which is the outermost. Um, and the lung. Uh, lung uh, couldn't be confused with any other organs of this module. So in the lung, what should you distinguish? Um, these are the bronchi. And bronchi, they have the same envelopes as uh, trachea has, but um, remember that starting from large bronchi, we can find muscularis mucosa, separating mucosa from the submucosa. And uh, in small bronchi, it is especially developed uh, and there it uh, performs the function of regulating the diameter, it's very important. And in the submucosa there are seromucous glands, uh, which are present in large middle bronchi, but not in the small. They disappear with uh, decreasing the diameter. And also there are hyaline cartilages. Uh, you remember that cartilage is O-shaped in large bronchi. It is discontinuous, I mean in primary, O-shaped in primary bronchi. In large bronchi it is discontinuous. Um, in middle diameter, it uh, changes, um, it decreases uh, in the number, in the size, uh, might be replaced with elastic cartilage, and in the small bronchi, it is uh, absent. Okay, and at the end of this video, I want to um, um, recommend you one online resource which is very helpful if you want not only to prepare for the module but if you want really to recognize specimens very well in future if you want to prepare for the international level examinations like iPhone, USMLE then please go there I'll put the hyperlink in the comments below and um, choose a slide box 
what uh, is especially interesting in this website is that if you choose um, any organ, for example, let's choose gastrointestinal tract uh, and let's choose, for example, esophagus, um, uh, you'll find here the possibility to see the organ in different magnifications. For example, this is the lower magnification and you can uh, clearly and uh, distinguish uh, the epithelium, muscularis mucosa, submucosa and the muscularis itself. Yeah? But also you may enlarge this organ up to the highest magnification, up to 400 times, I think. Uh, and then you will see all those details and you may distinguish yourself uh, as if you are working with a microscope, even better. I think it depends on your internet quality. Okay, <laughs> then, and you may see here stratified squamous epithelium very well. The muscularis mucosa, submucosa. And what is especially interesting, the muscularis here, and as I told you, in the esophagus and the upper one third in muscles, nuclei are at the periphery. So, this is the sign of skeletal muscle cells. Yeah. Also, there are some labelings and uh, you may use them these are the hyperlinks uh, so if you want to find uh, for example the muscularis mucosa you may click and um, it will be enlarged uh, for you it will be put in the center of uh, the view so please you have all the possibilities besides at the end of the semester we are going to provide uh, we are going to organize a competition for the most clever students um, so please use this resource to prepare for the competition it will be announced in our facebook page so you will be informed beforehand so good luck and thank you for watching and put comments below if you want to change our format if you want to recommend us to change anything thank you